Hello fellow Dendorites, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. And some might see it as cold-blooded to shed the trappings of man flesh, but there is one out there who's not going to turn down your worship. It is Dindar. He will eat the sun and he will make a new place for all Yanti on WebDM. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by the Dungeon Craft Kickstarter. Live now. Build your own battle maps in no time at all by using over a thousand pieces of gorgeous terrain. They're a cool looking, easy to store, and affordable way to level up your combat. Each book consists of reversible pieces for building dungeons, cityscapes, and wilderness, along with all the creatures you need to run your game. They've even got companion books for battles on the high seas or in hell. They sent us an early prototype, and they are useful as all get out. So check it out. Link here and in the description. Jim, once again, first of all, Tunnel Snakes rule. Tunnel Snakes rule. Just wanted to get that out of the way. We're talking about yon tea. Wan tea? Yeah. Yuan tea? I prefer personally snake people, serpent folk. Why would you know what they call themselves? The scaled ones. Yes, scaly kind. People of Yig. There's a lot of different uh, sort of names for them. And of course, there's a lot of our own uh, history and conspiracy theories you can draw from when dealing with reptilian humanoids, such as Yuan tea. <laughs> The British have a whole thing about reptilian people. This is probably one of my favorite of like the monstrous peoples. I'm a big fan of like pulp fantasy. Yeah. And so the stories of say the Serpent Man of Volusia uh, in the uh, King Cull stories or the various serpent people that show up in different uh, Conan tales or mythos horror. It's just like, all right, I'm, I'm here for this. Yeah, give me, give me all kinds of snake people, whether they got snake arms, snakes for heads, lower bodies of snakes, cut them open, snakes spill out of them. Give it to me, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah, they're like rushing nesting monsters, just snakes yes. within snakes. <laughs> snakes uh. are just kind of like tentacles. It's another way of doing a cosmic horror thing. I think probably for me, it's because snakes. I am not a particular fan of snakes. They're just one of those animals that I look at them and I'm just like, man, I hope we never meet each other. And because I've lived in Texas, that's not the case. And rattlesnakes, I've run into too many of them uh, in my life. It's one of those water things. moccasins. <laughs> water moccasins, copperheads. It's one of those animals that you're like, okay, you gotta stay away from this. This is a serpent, it's a snake. You know, there's strong mythological and mystical symbolism to them. Not and always was it bad. Like, not always. Snakes were, were no. seen as, as wise. It's just one of those things where I find they have such rich potential and they are an antagonist in Dungeons and Dragons that I think works really well. You could substitute them for drow. You can substitute them for tieflings. They've got that we used to be humans at one point, but we did something terrible to ourselves. I like that aspect of them particularly because it's it's one of those things of just like, this this could be you. Given enough time and enough bad, deci bad decisions, yeah. this could be you too. This could be you too. And if you get caught by them and they feel like that you would be a worthy addition to their society, they can turn you into to one of them. They can mm -hmm. create an abomination or a malison out of you and now you're just, you've had your emotions stripped from you and you've been suffused with serpentine magics and praise Dindar, eat the sun. Pra praise Dindar. The term morality tale has a whole new connotation when it comes to being turned into a snake person because it is that that whole like this ancient empire, mm -hmm. like the, at one point they were the, they were the top yeah. And now they're 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 hiding in the muck, waiting for their chance. Waiting for their chance to rise again. I find like the Yonti of uh, say the Forgotten Realms really inspiring, and that mm -hmm. country of them. I forget what it's called, like Naraja or something like that, around the Serpent Hills and the High Moor. These are like dry, dusty hills, and they're riddled with all these tunnels where they live. And then there's like this sulfurous mud flats nearby. You can just imagine these like serpent people that have evolved to live in this environment and they're used to just the steam and the sulfur and the poison of it and they're just waiting there and it's like you got everybody's got to stay out of here do not come do not come around here this is our place we are a country that that is in this world and and sort of like trying to revitalize their fallen empire and of course they must be up to no good which is why it's a great source of adventure or there's the yonti that are in cholt that you might use for your own games it's like they are the descendants of whatever indigenous empire was there that has long fallen and replaced by other successions of empires. Yeah, you guys like did this to yourselves. And I think that's why I like Yonti is that 
Whereas I look at like orcs and goblins and, and, and all the others and it's like someone did something to them right. and now they've just had so long of a bad run of it that they're the evil guys. No, Yanti, you guys you did this to yourself. Like, you know, like you're the ones who started worshiping these gods. You're the ones that transformed yourselves in, these, in this manner. You're the one that ripped your emotions from you and, and made you this sort of like cold calculating monster. And yeah. that's what's interesting about it. I've role played yeah. uh, a Yanti before. Yes. And that was the most interesting part, I think. Trying to role play uh, a, a superior, emotionless, just l no empathy, no sympathy. You still have to work with these people. I think there's a few inspirations from, from pop culture that you can draw on. I know I drew, on, I drew from a more evil version of Q, uh -huh. where it's just, you almost think of these things as just like, eh. It's yeah. it, it's it's whatever, but it's it's almost I would hate to say fun because they don't have emotions. Right. But you know, just being around these makes him kind of feel better because mm. it's proof of his own superiority. Yeah. Another m more recent would be uh, from the Orville, Isaac, who's the oh, robot, okay. who's the completely superior but emotionless. It's a great like watching that. It's like oh yeah, that's that's Yanti. And then the last one I think of Sherlock Holmes. Just the mentality of just having to deal with these idiots that you're surrounded by constantly. Yeah. Um, and you're just like, you're not even a human. It can be something to kind of draw from, from a role-playing perspective. You really gotta stretch yourself in these because this is an option that if you take it similar to say drow or tieflings or, or depending on what the way orcs are portrayed in your world, have a conversation about it with your group because you know the group might not appreciate like having a spy in their midst or someone who's just kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm tolerating being with you and you know, we'll, we'll see how long this lasts. So in that sense, I think like they're very uh, dependent on like party composition and what kind of campaign you're playing. But that's just if you're trying to use like baseline, and then, you know, you can reskin these guys in just about any, any way you want. And hell, they do every spring. Oh, right, there you go. Transformed humans, the uh, descendants yeah. of an ancient uh, magical society that they worship snakes and wanted to become more like them the potential for a reborn conflict that's millennia old, that now that these like hibernating serpent people are returning to activity, they're going to revive those conflicts. Yeah, we went into, you know, hibernation for eons to skip ahead far enough in time so that, you know, we would be in a, in a position to rebuild uh, our empire. We wouldn't have any competition from other big empires out there. And they looked forward in time, we're just like, yeah, if we put ourselves in the sleep, then we'll wake up and erupt from the ground out of these giant breeding pits of snakes. The world is made a little bit better for them to live in. Yeah. Maybe a little hotter, Maybe more little humid. Hotter, right. They wait out geological epochs that are incompatible with their uh, physiology. And, but I've always wanted to create a monster that vacillates between life and undeath. And when they want to go into hibernation, they transform themselves into a type of undead. But when they're ready to reemerge and, and be active in the world, they revitalize themselves. Someone that it has, if you conceive of, say, necrotic energy, more like balancing kind of act. And, 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 you know, they change their internal balance so that it's more like, say, dark necromancy. Mm -hmm. And then whenever they're ready to come out, they change it to light necromancy. And, mm -hmm. and they're sort of like suffused with healing magic and the like. And yeah. they shed their mummified, dry snake skin to emerge pristine and glistening. <laughs> ready to greet the world as exactly. Snicks. I am Snick. <laughs> so you see something like that. You come across a hibernation chamber of them. The presence of fresh blood awakens them before they're ready. The meat creatures have arrived. Let us awake yeah. from our slumber and have breakfast. If that was the case, then like maybe they would seed the world with clues as to their whereabouts so that people will come to try to find them, therefore ensuring that they have something to eat when they are ready. Those are more maybe way DMs <laughs> would conceive of them. Uh, what about some more player uh, options? The fact that they, they do want to add to their empire so they have that whole like capture not kill mentality. Mm -hmm. Like at least there that's a way to uh, ease into a party. When we played there were, well there were two Yanti and a <laughs> Druid. Right. And the Druid had kind of been out of it for a bit so yeah. it was more like the Yanti looked at each other and then looked at him it's like well at yeah. least we'll have some meat in case we run out of other meat with us. Like we literally looked at you as like our reserve food reserve stores. Reserve food, yes, I So let's that. keep yeah. them alive. <laughs> Outside of a party where two thirds of the party is comprised of yon tea, I mean, I could see how sometimes that might be a little rough to yeah. introduce into a normal, like, we're a heroic adventuring party and this is our yon tea, just don't worry about him. Yeah, yeah. Unless 
They were playing some kind of like illusionist enchanter. They have some disguised self, or maybe they're a warlock of sure. Dindar, yeah, yeah. and they they take disguised selves. They never appear as a Yanti. I yeah. mean, to me, that would be the heart of a Yanti, right? Like deception yes. is is their thing. I would love to play that because when that secret finally got out, you want to talk about drama. You want to talk about story at the gaming table. You're just embedding it for. 10 adventures down the road. And it could be that like time away from the Yonti and time away from their ritual cannibalistic practices, from their serpent magic, from all of that life in a, a deep undercover as a, as a spy for them. Like if they all know that you run the risk of like reversion and, and like your emotions coming back, but it's a risk, right? And so those Yonti that go out into the world to spy or gather information or something like that, like maybe they are seen as disposable in that way by their superiors. And it's like, yeah, you provide us valuable information, but when you come back from the outside world, you will be tainted. You will not be welcomed back in here because you're no longer pure. You've been swimming amongst the muck of, you know, these mongrel creatures. We were at the height of our civilization. They were just swinging through the trees kind of thing, you know, yeah. like that. You went to those liberal cities <laughs> and now you, <laughs> you learned all that to live with people. Oh, How dare forest. you? It's ripe for potential and you get that kind of like outcast from an evil society. If you're looking to do that and you don't want to do the more traditional half-orc or drow, Yonti is available for that. Or you could even just be like, they're not sinister. They're just like snake people and they're just weird and they're not the first player option that has like emotionless as part of their thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's several, of, like lizard folk have sort of an alien mindset like that. Uh, kobolds, Warforged. You could play, say, Dragonborn that way, depending on how you see the relationship between them and dragons. And even something like Ravnica, the, the Vettelkin, I believe, mm -hmm. they have that kind of same very cerebral, we, we removed our sort of emotions and our a different kind of person. Simic hybrids. It was similar to I don't even know what that would be. But maybe it is one of those things where it's like you're, the magic still has to fight against uh, your, you know, your natural inclinations. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't renew it through these ritual practices in their society, then maybe you do revert. That's the reason why they just send these low people on the totem pole out into the world. The pure blood. Because the more snake you look like, the more power you have in their society. So if you just look like a person, you got like little fangs or maybe some scales behind the ears. Yeah, the vertical like, slit eyes. I like them for, for not just like snake people, but like as this is a human that's experimented on themselves uh, to some degree. I, in Land Between Two Rivers, Yonti are often the product of vivamancers. Most things in, in Land Between Two Rivers are both its thing. You know, there are Yonti there, but then I will also take them and reskin them for other things. So they represent a wastelanders that yeah. have had something done to them or did it to themselves. When it comes to picking what kind of, like if you're snake people, well, what kind of snake? Sure. Like there are so many different kinds of snakes you could you could come from. A Yonti coral snake, like with the you know red, black, and yellow stripes. You know, what would that look like? Or like a diamond back of a black adder, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, these are these are all different. Um, Cause I think I, I went with a black mamba for Salazar. Yeah. That was the base for him. Yes. Like I like the black and the red. And there's so many different varieties. I would play more of their interaction with what, how, how evil they are based off the kind of snake. If they're just like a, like a grass snake, they're from, you know, some grasslands. They just want to be left alone. They just, yeah. you know, do their thing. They hunt small prey. They could be anything. Like, they could be anything, yeah. You could have great big constrictor snakes and maybe you switch around their stats a little bit, you know, give them a strength instead of say charisma, or, you know, take away their poison immunity and poison spray and maybe give them like a bonus to grapple or something like that. And now you've got powerful like build. a powerful build. Now you've got wise beyond their years because they live for first forever kind of snake person, a, a, a someone who's maybe seen as a sage, their emotionlessness is seen as an asset. And it's like, yeah, they, we found a place for them. They recognize the value of being part of our society and we take advantage of their different perspective. We appreciate the fact that this, uh, you know, this group of very <laughs> slow, very methodical, very patient reptiloids yeah. uh, have something to offer us because they think right. differently. And, and with that different way of thinking, that lack of emotion, they're of course less likely to get rattled. Oh, I'm trying to think of like other serpent type creatures that they might be connected with. The one that immediately comes to mind is Naga. Uh, of course, whether it's antagonistic or more cooperative, Hydra would be one. Even just like dragons, you know, like there's all sorts of creatures in the monster mail that like- Different versions of dragons don't have legs and they're oh, more like right. serpent. I mean, you know, like more like Chinese dragons. It makes sense to that you can just kind of trim a little bit and yeah. uh, you know, these guys yeah. are just like kind of the 
kobolds instead of kobolds to dragon. It could very much be that they are the ones that are the true descendants of that instead of say kobolds or, or even dragonborn. Or you could just sort of like mix them all together and just say like these are the reptiloids. <laughs> we've got tortles, we've got yonti, we've got lizard folk and kobolds and dragonborn. One of the things I like sort of about Tiamat from her you know mythological origins is the idea of like yeah she's just like hanging out with Abzu and a bunch of gods came along and killed her husband and now she's just like pissed about it and she'd rather be just like asleep and chilling out in the oceans. It's only just like the chattering of these mice. Nothing furry creatures they don't even lay eggs. They give, how gross is it to give birth to live young with milk? Like how disgusting is that? Like maybe that's just the basis for it. It's a little mammalian. All of these reptiloid uh, peoples are put on the earth to just like cleanse it of, of all these mammals and make it safe for dragons and, uh, and serpent uh, kind again because God, they just breed like, well, they, they breed like mammals. The concepts that you can you can make with this character, given the traits, especially that, that charisma int yeah. bonus, it's a little weird. If they're emotionless, why do they have a charisma bonus? Unless it's like their lack of emotion makes them more adept at manipulating others, right? Well, they're just standoffish. I mean, uh, it's the ultimate like Dow of, of Steve or whatever. Sure. Like since they, they don't show any interest, everybody, you know, nature abhors <laughs> a vacuum. They're just constantly negging people. They're the ultimate <laughs> bad boys, right? <laughs> just reminds me of my father. Your father had scales? Well, no, but... No, but he treated me the same way. Me. Charisma is there because... I, I, this is really one where I feel like they, they want you to play like warlocks and sorcerers. Or just any kind of real casting because, I mean, a little bump to int. Uh, also, I yeah. mean, you could be a wizard. What game was we were running where someone playing like a, a Yaunty Mystic? Oh, that was Josh in the... Uh... He had like giant growth and, and he took all of the spell, all of the powers that like let him change his physical form. And so you just like turn into like giant constrictors and like just enormous like snakes. <laughs> yeah, I remember him soloing that lich for a while. So there was that. That's maybe one way to do it, that, um, that they just represent any kind of like int-based uh, caster. Maybe you flip it around, it's plus two int plus one uh, charisma. I just took that uh, that charisma bonus and uh, made a paladin. Oh uh, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, everything else, who cares? Yeah. Uh, but at least I can put my lower stat in charisma and it won't be as low, is yes. the way I saw it. So my Invisible Sun character was a serpent person. Uh, she called upon the serpent. And it was like one of the things that I had for, for her was like her the spells that she would have selected would be reflected in the color of her scales. In Invisible Sun, every school of magic has a color associated with it, right? So maybe you could like translate something like that to D&D. &D, and if you've got like a sorcerer or a wizard yonti and they do have scales or something like that, that maybe um, the kind of magic that they're proficient in is reflected in arcane patterns or runes on their scales. That changes over time. You could do that with, say, a draconic lineage uh, sorcerer and go like, well, maybe it's, we're gonna like slightly reskin this and maybe pick a, you know, energy type that fits more like serpent. The wings are gonna be like feathered wings, you know, so you get that sort of like multicolored cosmic serpent feel to them. Now I've talked myself into a D&D into &D character. You can heighten up and, and play up that magical element to them. The fact that they do have this strong connection with magic and the like, you can like lean into that and make them more than just people with like snake features that they are magical snake creatures really find inspiration in the mythology and the like of uh, you know serpent gods to uh, to make a caster dendar be praised dendar be praised <clears throat> I, I like a good mythology that involves a cosmic serpent you know like shedding its scales and creating stars and planets the first gods being bahamut and tiamat and their conflicts fueling like the creation of worlds and mountains and rivers and things the first celestials being massive serpents that that come and live in the world and like impart the the wisdom of the gods to people maybe it's not like a, a reptilians versus mammalians thing but it's like the reptiloids were the first people here and they see it as their responsibility to like usher uh, everyone in into that there's well, just so we much were, going we on were, with we were, Yonti, right? we were like, brushing in uh talking about concepts with the uh, with the with the traits but we can go ahead and move into that because uh, like i already said charisma plus two and plus one mm -hmm. um they get dark vision hey why wouldn't they why wouldn't they um, yeah. snakes can see in the dark the trend that is uh, as of late which is the innate spell casting yeah. of these player races that's the new hotness that is the new hotness i mean it's, it's old but it's still like you know it seems like uh half of them now getting poison spray as a cantrip it's, a, it's one of those cantrips I find that people usually don't take, but when you have it, yeah. like I used it quite a bit. If you don't have a uh, 
you know, a class that has something like that, then it could be handy. Poison is one of those damage types that if you're looking at just like pure numbers and breakdown along with fire, one of those is really commonly resisted by monsters and the like. I think a lot of people discount it or, or don't like consider it as maybe an option or something, but having access to it, certainly thematic, there's all different ways you can reskin it. The big thing with any kind of innate spell casting is the, to answer the question, are these actual spells? As in, does this person have to do the gestures, say the words, use the material components? Can it be counterspelled? Can it be dispelled? Like, is it a spell? Or is it just using spells as a way to uh, shorthand a, a special ability? Uh, to me, that's always something I, I, I want to answer. And it's one of those things where it's like any kind of innate spell casting, whether it's Yonti or Furlbogs or Drow or something like that, I'm more inclined to say like, this is a consequence of the magic inherent in you. And like spells represent the ability of someone that doesn't have inherent magic working their magic. You've got poison spray because you're a snake person. You have a poison gland in your jaw right. and you constrict your muscles <laughs> in your mouth it's and shoot right. it out. You know, your animal friendship with snakes is a consequence of, of all different, of just like some of its training, some of it's like a very subtle form of magic. Uh, maybe it's that all of these serpents are really super intelligent. And if, if only we just listened to them and talked to them, then maybe we'd all get along. What they're trying to do is <laughs> tell us how to, how to change our lives for the better and we right. run away screaming. I do love that whole, the animal friendship with snakes, like, at will. And it's so thematic, and I think we carried around just a bag of snakes. Because at any time when we would need to, like, hey, animal friendship, go do a thing. But then suggestion once a day, which this this kind of goes back to, I just think of uh, Jungle Book. Oh, yeah. And yeah. just the, the spirally eyes, yeah. and just, this is it, it's snakes, you gotta, you gotta watch them. Like, the suggestion's kind of that, um, it, it does play into that sort of like a reverse of the snake charmer archetype, but it is that the the mystical, the yeah, don't just they're just gonna talk to you and you'll do something. It's not overt. There's nothing necessarily flashy about it. It's that creepiness, it's the subtlety, it's the deception that makes Yanti so fun to play. Mm -hmm. Even if they're even if they're like play along and they're good, like they might just be mistaken, like, oh, you're a serpent person and have to deal with the fact that maybe people just don't trust you or have to work harder to uh, to gain their trust and maybe eventually they, you know, overcome their difficulties and it's all good and blah, blah, blah. Having that in your back pocket is uh, certainly pretty fun. A fun suggestion, uh, place at the right moment can yeah. stave off so many combat. Yeah. You just tell someone, can you just go take a lap, please? Yeah, just go take a lap. <laughs> just walk away. That's my favorite one for suggestion. Just, just walk away. Just Put down your weapon and walk away. You don't even have to fight. I just love the open-ended, yeah, you have to follow this for eight hours. It's a powerful spell. It's cool to have. It sort of like reinforces their sort of themes. Mm -hmm. Of course, all these things can be changed up and, and made more specific to your specific type of Yonti. But of course, when you do that much stuff to your own body with magic, you're gonna develop some resistance. You're gonna, you're gonna build up that resistance a bit, so that's maybe why the uh, pure bloods can't go full snake. Magic resistance is one of those abilities that changes practically every edition of D&D. It used to be like a percentile that you just like you rolled and you had to get above it. After that, it was sort of like a static number that you had to get above on a caster check. Mm -hmm. There've been spells that'll lower it or whatever. Now in fifth edition, it's just sort of you know advantage on saves versus magic, uh, or save versus spells and sort of spell-like effects. And on on the one hand, I miss the old school, oh yeah, you didn't, I've got 95% magic resistance, <laughs> not touching me. Because it also was like, yeah, I, that means I cannot benefit from good, from beneficial spells. I can't be healed. I can't benefit from a haste or a dimension door. Yeah, some creatures could lower it voluntarily, but then they don't have their protection against, uh, against magic there. It's a strong ability in fifth edition, but isn't the like, killer ability that it's been in, in priors. Closest thing I can think of is what, gnome that gets advantage on int, charisma, and wisdom saves on magical effects or something. This is just, you know, magic resistance. And if you were playing like an Oath of Ancients Paladin, you could also have resistance to magic damage. And... I mean, I went Oath of Conquest, but I can see that. I like Oath of Ancients just because of the resistance to magic damage uh, aura ability. And I just like the theme of that uh, style of Paladin. An ancient kind of uh, like tree viper or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, one of those ones that just coils. The world the tree's trees. been trying to fracture apart since the beginning and only yeah. by my coils am I keeping it together. Right. It's sort of like an opposite of the, uh, the, the serpent choose, you know, 
know, gnaws at the roots of the world tree. It's yeah. the serpent protects the world tree. That could be the secret hidden truth. Yeah. That the mammalians, they have perverted, they perverted for their it, own yeah. propaganda yeah. against stupid mammalians. Of course, they have poison immunity, yeah. immune to the poison condition. Yes. Which, you know, that takes care of that. Poison condition is like the feature of a lot of low-level monsters and mid-level monsters as well. And just like be, and, and some nasty effects come along with uh, with poison. You know, it, it's one of those things where I, I, you know, I'm not sure if you're a DM out there poisoning your enemy's weapons. You can and probably should if it's appropriate. And this is have some fun with it. And this is just one of those where it's like, yeah, I don't want to be knocked unconscious by this thing. I don't want to have to take an extra 12 d6 damage. I don't want to have to deal with all this. Just give me the weapon and and you know, don't worry about it. Given how common poison is, I can see it coming up uh, quite a bit. And of course, language is, you know, common abyssal, draconic, because, uh, you know, their their god is kind of evil. They're kind of descendant from dragons if they're more serpentine. I mean, it's it's whatever. You know, I would let them, you know, speak with serpents and, and, and talk with them. I'd let them uh, do all kinds of serpent uh, magic adjacent things just to, like, reinforce the flavor of them and everything. I love Yonti, and I, I've, I've tried to work them into every uh, setting that I have. I try to find a place for them, mm -hmm. mostly because I do think they make great villains. Look at them just a little bit differently. You don't, like, have them be always wicked, always evil, uh, and you just have them more more alien and, yeah. and unknowable and weird. It's closer to how I have the, the Yonti planet Star Bound. They haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. It's like Thulsa Doom, not evil, just weird. weird. More hedonistic, not so much evil. Yes. And so yeah. I'm sure Elry will love it. And of course there are the uh, Yonti fertility cults. You should never forget about those. Never forget about a good fertility cult. Never forget about a good breeding pit. <laughs> if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you need more WebDM talk, we've got a podcast and a whole lot more on our Patreon. We just talked to Wolfgang Bauer, the head of Cobalt Press, about D&D, his career, and more. It's available free, so download it now. Oh! And he gave our patrons a huge discount on some great stuff, too. Link here and in the description. Hi, nice to meet Hello. you. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> you guys look really bloody. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Matt. Hey. Oh, no. Fresh batch of cookies today, just so you know. Oh, There we go. Three, two, one. Yeah. Just realized who they were. <laughs> Dude, what? I just realized sure. you were. Thank you, my son. So, I mean, Ilmater's blessings be upon you. Oh. By the way, I love your guys' stuff. I oh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I, I really do. I, I like going on there. And what? If you talk to Emma over there, uh, she could probably give you a cookie that I made this morning. Oh. So. Um, the Sphinx, uh, you know, support system. Uh huh. It's pretty infallible. Like, um, yeah. There's not. I mean, they want to kill a couple of. I have oh four, sure, right. I have four Sphinxes that take a certain section of the city, and yeah. uh, so. Sure, you're burning their half lion, right? Like they gotta eat something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't. I don't discourage it, but yeah, I just wanted to tell you that. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Super, Thank you. super helpful, and appreciate you guys' work. Well, I know, but if I walk in the building, would you still be able to hear it? Because I was going to walk in there behind Tales from the Mist and then turn around. I mean, I don't want to be too intrusive because I don't want to mess with their with their vibe. 